Hi, and thanks for joining us for this webinar on Seven Habits of Highly Successful K-8 Science Teachers. My name is Francis Vigent. I'm glad that you've all been able to join us today. To give you a little bit of background on myself and a little bit on the webinar itself, I'm a former elementary and middle school and high school science, technology, engineering, and math teacher. And I had the privilege of uh, teaching for almost 10 years, grading students and uh, covering these different grade levels. And along the way, I had the opportunity to have my students for about five or six years placing in the top 10 uh, in our state and, and even in our country. So, uh, and that was on the, uh, uh, the NEAPs and also NECAP assessments, which are national and state level standardized testing. Uh, assessments. And so my life today is here as a co-founder and uh, CEO of No Atom. And what we do here at No Atom is, uh, well, first of all, we're a group of teachers really focused on higher order thinking. Our interest is really in helping classrooms effectively develop students' creative, evaluative, and analytical thinking skills. And the way that that connects to science, technology, engineering, and math, and our experience in the classroom, is really by helping engage students authentically and providing the resources, the tools, and the supports to do that. So today's webinar is really a professional development session to think about sort of these um, habits, these these habits of highly successful K-8 teachers, uh, some that uh, I had as a teacher myself, but others that we have observed over hundreds and uh, thousands of classrooms over the last 12 years uh, that no Adam has been in existence. So moving forward, the next uh, hour of our time together is going to be spent looking really at two areas. One, the nature of science and engineering under the new standards, and two, those seven habits of highly effective K-8 science teachers. Throughout the session, if you are on the live session, we uh, do have opportunity to take questions. And so if you have any questions or any problems along the way, feel free to drop those in. Uh, Karen Peake is also on the live webinar with me and will be helping to uh, field some of those questions. There are about a thousand people uh, engaged here in our webinar today, so it will be tough to get to all the questions, but I hope as we're going along that you'll drop those in. So jumping straight in here, the nature of science and engineering under NGSS. First, what I want to do is take a look at the STEM cycle and what science and engineering is. If you've been on any other webinar with me, I always like to start by talking about this because it fundamentally uh, defines science and engineering and what STEM, the acronym known as STEM, science, technology, engineering, and math really is. So science is knowledge from experimentation, but scientists engage in answering questions from experiments by planning them and developing them and coming to evidence-based conclusions. Engineers use that knowledge to solve problems. So they identify and solve problems by prototyping. And they prototype and test those prototypes to develop new technology. Technology is anything that solves a problem. Math is at the center of it all because it's our language for communication. And so you might call this a STEM cycle. You might call this the nature of science and engineering, the way that it's uh, framed in the new standards. Or you may just call this the cycle of innovation because scientists and the knowledge they develop help engineers to uh, solve problems and that technology that engineers produce uh, helps scientists to answer and even ask new and different questions. And so science is not about uh, you know, making things bubble. It's not about um, you know, know the facts, knowing all the facts. Engineers are not all about building things. Okay, engineers are about solving problems. How they do that may be processes, maybe things you can't even touch, like computer software. So I want to put that out there because that's not always the way uh, folks <laughs> have been defining science and engineering. And in fact, to be highly effective, you really need to uh, wrap your mind around this, but also your students need to be able to articulate and understand and actually live this, this cycle themselves in your classroom day to day. The next bit uh, that I wanted to focus on before we jump into these uh, seven habits is what traditional instruction is and how 
next generation instruction is different. Um, why traditional instruction is no longer effective under these new standards. So a traditional model of instruction is one where content flows through a teacher and that teacher is the kind of content, content expert who models facts, demonstrates phenomena, and explains what things are to students. In that environment, students are in a, in a rote recall situation. They have to recall the facts, repeat the demonstration, summarize the phenomena, and traditional assessments, when you look at the kind of um, you know, multiple choice assessments that are common across uh, the United States, they are often just looking for fact recall, but under the new standards that's entirely changed. So I want to point this out because when I start to talk about what makes people highly effective, um, and even folks like myself, uh, you know, the reason that our students performed so well is that even under the former standards, we never really used this model of instruction. It's just that under the new standards, this model of instruction is totally obsolete. You can't get by with it. Under the previous set of standards, you could. Um, or at least you could get somewhere. You could get to, to average for the state, which depends on what state you're in. If you're in Illinois, you know, might be in the teens for advanced and proficient scoring students. If you're in a place like Massachusetts, you're looking at around 50%, sometimes lower, depending on the grade level. Um, and then, you know, every shade in between. Now, if it, and when I talk about highly effective classrooms, and what I'm talking about is uh, where people are achieving 80, 90, 100% advanced and proficient uh, levels of students. And the thing is, is that you don't have to start with students who are at that level to get there, or even close by. So what's the difference? Well, here the teacher is content expert. The content flows through that teacher. The new standards require creating, evaluating, and analyzing to happen simultaneously, and those are our higher order thinking skills. So that's why it's been rearranged here. Most people um, who are kind of at an average level are really trying to climb a ladder, thinking about, well, I want the students to remember first, and then, you know, we'll move on to understanding, and then we'll move on to applying. It doesn't really work that way. Uh, what you want to do is start at the top. You want to get students uh, creating things, evaluating their creations, and analyzing the outcomes simultaneously because those skills actually require students to remember, understand, and apply. Okay, the way that that is shown in the new standards is in those science and engineering practices and how these three foundations come together. They actually support the performance expectations of the next generation science standards. A next generation model of instruction looks like this. Do you see how the role of the teacher has changed? The role that the teacher is playing here is as a very skillful coach. They're trying to strengthen the connection between the students in the development of skills, the science and engineering practice skills within that student, and the content itself. So that's your disciplinary core ideas and cross-cutting concepts. The key here is that students are developing and using the content by solving problems and answering questions, and the teacher is helping to gradually adjust the supports for the students. They're helping the students understand how to engage help the students understand how to engage appropriately, and they're redirecting and monitoring this sort of lab environment. And this is true K to 8. I don't want you to hear me use words like lab or lab environment and think that must be like a, you know, uh, an expensive 8th grade science lab with, you know, black top tables and hoods and things. No, I'm talking about your, you know, first grade, second grade kindergarten students, you know, cross leg on the floor, maybe, you know, doing science on the lunch tables, okay? That's what I'm talking about. Now, the students, remember when I showed you this diagram a second ago, I said the student is in a situation where the definition of proficiency is kind of a rote recall. Over here, the definition of proficiency for a student is very different. You see, proficiency is not about what the students recall, it's about their ability to demonstrate that they can develop and use the content, that they um, can use those science and engineering practices to solve problems and answer questions, and that they can form relationships between ideas and be able to di uh, un understand but also describe 
um, the dynamic interactions between different areas of content. Okay, so um, that would be something, just a quick example of this would be how um, temperature affects the water cycle and how the water cycle affects the rock cycle and how that shapes the land and how the interaction of all these parts actually impact ecosystems and the kind of plants and animals that can live in a particular area or can't live in a particular area. So this next generation model of inquiry is, is, is really hi what highly effective teachers have been using for a long time. It's just that unfortunately um, folks who ha haven't been clued into this for whatever reason, um, you know, now they are kind of being forced to switch to this model because the next generation of standardized test assessments are going to be testing students' ability to demonstrate, um, and you can see that right here, demonstrate their understanding, not remember a fact. And that's what, the, for most states, some states have had more skills required than others, but most states uh, previously functioned off of multiple choice. And so multiple choice fact recall. So I'm going to leave that behind. But uh, it, as you have questions, please drop those questions in, and we will uh, do what we can do to get to those. If anybody's joining late, I know folks are jumping in from class, um, we will make a recording available to you after. If you want something more specific uh, than a recording of this, please reach out to Karen or um, through noadam.com, and somebody will reach back to you to get you what you need. So the seven habits of highly effective K-8 science teachers, the first habit really focuses on starting with why. And what I mean by starting with why is per having purpose-driven instruction, okay? Why is challenging students to seek meaning and purpose and what is going on in the classroom? Now, that might sound like, well, okay, that's what we always do. Well. Here's the difference between what some people always do and what other people always do that works a bit better. You see, we can read a nonfiction piece and we can say, well, what was John, you know, what was the um, Alaskan Husky team doing dragging the sled across, you know, X, Y, Z? Uh, or we can say, you know, any other kind of what type questions. But if we turn it around and we look at that that nonfiction reading and we challenge students to ask to explain why to connect with the purpose, you know, you know why if we read something about the Iditarod and Alaskan dog sled races as part of a unit in science, then we would be asking students questions to challenge and seek meaning and purpose, like, you know, why is this there and I did a rod. Why are you know what would be different if if we if they didn't use a lot, the huskies they used uh, horses instead or they tried to use you know donkeys or, or some other animal you know why are the dogs unique um, and and so what you know or f further like instead of just a race how might this be helpful to people who live in areas where there's snow on the ground, much more snow than we get where we live, um, or who don't have roads like we have. So challenging the students to seek meaning and purpose has to do with how you question and how you launch into a unit. Um, what is then sort of the space that you create for students to go from that purpose and meaning and actually take action on it. So typically in the case of a science or engineering classroom, what we're talking about here is students stepping into the, the purposeful role of scientist or engineer. So think about that as a problem or question that the students can then um, answer. So they've connected with some the permit, purpose and meaning of some reading or the context of this unit, but now they're going to take that and they're going to they're going to take those concept to concept, concept to self, concept to world connections further by actually being scientists and engineers. And I want to underscore that, being, not doing, but being scientists and engineers. They're going to try to answer questions and solve problems. 
And that's how students get in. So how do they get into the role of scientist engineer? They have to actually detail a plan of action, which they then carry out hands-on or you know, through whatever other means. And so you can see here that why is the purpose of the what? The what is the purpose of the how? And the how is the purpose of the little bits and pieces that are in front of a student that they actually work with. Okay, so this is very different than what we often see in less effective classrooms. Okay, ineffective practices that try to kind of scratch the surface at these same things is telling students why something is important. Okay, nobody cares. Kids don't care. <laughs> okay, it, you know, it's like you can tell me a million things, but until I really need that, until I really connect with it myself, it doesn't really mean anything to me. Okay. Around the what, ineffective things that often happen in the classroom that we see is this sort of attempt to list the expectation that what students are going to do is listen, remember, summarize, or participate in some way. And, you know, participation can have a very, very broad definition, okay? But you want something very specific if you want to be effective here, okay? And it's something that's, that's on the student and not on the teacher, and that sometimes can kind of get... A bit cloudy. The next bit here is the how. So the ineffective things that um, sometimes get in the mix for folks is instead of the students creating a plan of action with a partner or individually and then carrying that out and to you know working through some checkpoints and coaching uh, with their teacher, instead what often happens is that teachers get into this mode of demonstrating telling and giving students and you you know the, the word is here's what you need to do or here's what to do or what did I say to do I mean you hear these little phrases that leak out and they're just signals that this is what's going on in the classroom okay not effective uh, kind of mediocre um, you can get to kind of middle of the road with that sort of stuff with any of these things uh, but if you want to be highly effective you need to put it on the students and then that's where again that next generation model of inquiry comes in where the teacher as coach. You're not going to abandon the students without accountability and without feedback. We're going to get to that in a second. Um, you're an important part of this. It's, it's a much more skillful part than handing out and telling, handing out worksheets, texts, and templates for students to do, um, you know, to, to coach students through this process is much more skillful. So, so key takeaway here is that purposeful instruction, this is something you can do tomorrow, redefine and connect why, what, and how. You know, and do it from the student's perspective. And do it through questioning, doing, do, do it by calling out space for students to actually be scientists and engineer. And don't just launch into, you know, there shouldn't really be demonstrations and, and telling and all of this. It should be questioning. Okay, question, create the opportunity for students to plan, question, and then you as teacher question their plan, and then give students the freedom and the trust, uh, trust them to carry out those plans, and then work with the results of what they have done. Okay, and that leads us to our second habit of highly effective teachers. That is, and this sounds very cliche, believing in students, specifically their words, their thoughts, and their actions. Okay, and this isn't cliche. <laughs> it sounds cliche, but it's not cliche. So what do I mean by believing in students? What I mean is that uh, something like Socratic dialogue, what you're doing is you are asking your class, perhaps as opening, as you're, you're actually opening your um, time together, you've just read together, and now you're going to actually launch into the, the, the inquiry component of of your lesson, you want to ask students questions that require them to create, evaluate, and analyze. Those are questions that are like the how could, the why, the what if, or why would, and type questions. And whatever a student gives you, you want to take it seriously. That's what I mean by believing, okay? Believe what they tell you, whether or not you know it's wrong, believe it and then what you want to do is you want to f to force them to argue and back up defend what they've said okay so that's the purpose of the question if they've said something take it seriously believe in it take their word 
and then ask them questions about it. And as you ask questions, what you want to be doing is looping in students from other areas of the class who may have opposing ideas, or maybe they agree. So agree or disagree, something may be right, may be wrong, may be unclear to you whether the student is right or wrong. But ask the students questions and get them to play off of each other. And that's what Socratic dialogue is all about. So highly effective teachers often use some form of Socratic dialogue or Socratic questioning. Um, and we have an entire uh, webinar devoted to that. And you'll see as we go along um, that there have been uh, at the bottom some links to other free resources. I'd encourage you to take a look at this one uh, because it shows you, uh, it kind of walks you through how to have a next generation group Socratic dialogue. So just noadam.com forward slash Socratic, um, where you, you know, this is not a lecture. What this is, is this is students giving their ideas to other students, and the teacher is actually uh, facilitating or helping moderate that forum. That's it. Okay. The other thing is, is that it's not just about the questioning and that sort of back and forth dialogue, but it's about uh, believing in students' ideas about how they might solve a problem or answer a question. So that's their planning. You have to create the space for them to plan, and then when they come up with a plan, you take what they have planned, you believe in it, and you ask questions. Okay, and so by asking questions about their plan, what you're going to see is students coming to checkpoints like you see here. You're going to see students starting to rely on each other, their lab partners. You ask a question, that student didn't really know. He's going to look to his partner. His partner's going to try to clarify, and if they can't answer it, they're going to realize that they had a hole in their thinking because you've just pointed it out without telling them you asked the question. And so you're going to U-turn them, send them back to modify their plan. Okay, so so believing in students is 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 key. It's taking them seriously, and it helps to create a very serious, authentic environment in the classroom. And and you know sometimes people see this if they give students lab coats or goggles, for instance. You know suddenly the students behave entirely different. And the reality is is that that those goggles are just a symbol of science being something real, that you take this seriously. And you know, unfortunately, the, one of the big differences between highly effective classrooms and, and those that aren't are how seriously the adult takes the students, and the, specifically those students' ideas, their actions, their thoughts, okay? Whether it's in writing, whether it's verbally, whether it's in the form of a project of some kind, okay? So this leads us to our third habit, which is setting accurate expectations about effort and deliberate practice. Um, this may come as a surprise. Um, it depends where you are on that spectrum between, you know, not effective yet and highly effective. Uh, setting accurate expectations about effort and deliberate practice is key. You would not believe how many students uh, are frustrated because they look at another student who accomplishes something and believes that they should be able to accomplish it just as quickly. And they don't realize how much practice or opportunity another student has had to reach you know, the level that they're at, um, and that perhaps opportunity hasn't been afforded to the student who's struggling. Beyond that, within a class, entire classes need to struggle. Okay, you need to challenge students at a level where the entire class struggles. You need productive struggle. Okay, and that comes from, and, and, and I'm going to kind of read you a little passage here in a second, but, but if you don't set an accurate expectation, you don't help students uh, develop an accurate expectation, then what happens is, is they disengage. They just believe that they are somehow n naturally not good at something. Uh, they don't have a natural ability and they will disengage. And so effort goes down, practice goes down, engagement goes down, all of it, just everything goes down and it's just not what you want. Now I want to show you from a student's perspective what this kind of looks like actually after the fact with one of my very own students. And uh, this is a student I had about 10 years ago, and a couple years ago sent me a note. And this is what they said, because I want you to try and you know think about uh, the, the word choice and how the student is reflecting 
on their time in class, what it was like at the time, and what it's like now. So I'm going to read this to you. I just wanted to tell you that everything you taught me has served me so well since my graduation from MHT. I went on to love science at Rye Junior High School, and now I'm an honors science student at Portsmouth High School. I'm currently a sophomore and have completed physical science honors, earth science honors, and ecology honors. Biology honors starts next semester for me. So I want to pause here for one second. So this student sounds like, from the opening here, and I'd taken a, 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 just a snippet, uh, that he must have been the perfect student. And the reality was he wasn't. Um, he was a student like most other students. Um, he had challenges at home like many other students have. Um, but nonetheless, you know, he reaches back and, and look at what he's accomplished. Seems ideal. But I want you to pay attention to this next paragraph. This is what his experience was like in my class. I can still remember how I thought your class was so hard. And by the way, he capitalized that and that the format of our science labs was so tedious and boring to use. Imagine that, my class was tedious and boring and hard. It turns out that I and many other MHT kids in my class were some of the only kids to have such a strong understanding of the scientific method, or what might call the scientific process, and how to create correctly, sorry, and how to correctly write a science lab. It has been beyond useful to me and has allowed me to really take my science classes seriously and receive great grades as a result. I just learned such excellent critical thinking skills in your classes, and I now know that hard work was worth it on those days when I would get so confused with what we were doing and have to really push through. It turned out to be all for the best. And then he goes on to say, in, uh, in eighth grade, I was awarded the New England League of Middle School Scholar, so on. Last year, I was runner-up for the McAuliffe Shepherd Space Camp Scholarship. And just today, I was invited to the party that the science teachers host twice a year for students with top grades in their class. I received the highest grade out of my entire honors ecology class. I like to think a lot of the achievements were a result of the education you provided that led me to loving science in middle and high school. Anyway, I know you're not at MHT. I hope no Adam is going well, and so on, that you can use it to help other kids the way you helped me. What I want to point out from this is that you see the full arc here. And this is why, as teachers, we absolutely have to have high expectations of our students. And we have to, uh, and we'll look at this in a second, develop a culture of grit in the classroom. Every, you know, we didn't do test prep, and my, my students performed 40% over the state average in order to, and that's, that's the level they were, they were operating at. Uh, the reality, though, is, is that my class was harder than their test. And the thing was, is it wasn't harder because I was drilling them. It was harder because they had to think they got, had to get confused. They had to do things that were tedious and sometimes boring. And just as he said here, and this is why I underlined it, he, there were days that he had to just really push through. And I wanted that on purpose. Okay, If my students don't have to push through anything, then they run the risk of being a fragile perfect. And they really run the lit risk of a... a, a, a um, unfortunate concept of reality, okay? And so it, what's really great about this letter, and this was came out of nowhere. Uh, a few years ago, he sends this email to me, and I, you know, I cried reading it. Um, but, you know, this is what it's all about for every teacher, okay? And so the way that you create a culture of grit in the science classroom is relatively straightforward, but what's hard about it is it's very hard to hold those expectations consistent over time. So here's how you do it. Okay. So the and I would recommend two books as part of this must reads: Grit by Angela Duckworth and Mindset by Carol Dweck. The first thing you have to do is acknowledge that acquiring valuable skills is hard work, and that effort makes any skill that you have more productive. Okay. So in our classroom, we are engaged in hard work. And we are going to make whatever skill we have productive. And by the way, number two, the kind of deliberate practice that produces skills is not fun. 
It's often confusing and then we're going to make mistakes, but we aren't going to fail because we're not going to, to stop trying. Okay, so that leads to, lead to number three, to help students anticipate that hard emotions are, like frustration and confusion are normal. Okay, we're all dealing with this, okay, whether we're adults or students. And we need to set that, whether it's a kindergarten classroom, first, fifth, eighth grade. Okay, if you want to have a highly effective classroom, this needs to be part of the culture, this needs to be part of on an everyday basis. So embracing a growth mindset from Carol Dweck's book, a growth mindset is the idea that we can work towards our goals. Okay, it's not so much whether or not we're good. We're not whether or not we're good at something. We're just not good at some things yet. Okay, so if a student says, "I can't," blah blah blah, you need to train your students to say at the end of that, "Well, not yet." Okay, and that's key. You're not good at X Y Z yet, but we know hard work can get us there, and that's what we're here for. That's what we're doing. And you know what? We're going to be able to answer this question or solve this problem. We're going to get closer to it. Okay? So as a teacher, a key piece of this, when you kind of saw that earlier picture here, right? You know, you're coaching. You're acting as coach, not sage on the stage in this next generation model. A key piece is to listen past the student's words. They're going to tell you something when you ask them a question. What you want to listen for is what they mean. Okay, so they're going to say something to you, and they're going to have what they say is not going to line up with what they mean, and so you're going to have to ask them another question. And part, the whole purpose of this is to help them build the tools to express their meaning, and and oftentimes it's verbally, but it's not just verbally; it's in writing, to so different modalities. Okay. Number six, you want to use st examples of your own struggles to help students understand that it's not just them, that, you know, uh, adults aren't good at everything either, okay, that adults engage in hard work. So by engaging in hard work as students, we develop skills that are going to help us as adults, okay, these tools that we're learning are going to help us not just now, but as adults. We want to question students about their ideas and provide them immediate feedback. Okay, we don't want students to run off for an hour developing a plan, doing something, and then just sort of look at the result of it. What we want to do is have checkpoints so that students are getting immediate feedback all the way along every five, ten minutes, okay, fifteen minutes. Student teams are coming up and filtering through. Lastly, what I want to mention is that part of supporting a culture of grit in your classroom is focusing on grading the student's progress and not the product delivered. Okay, what I mean by that is, is you want to look at the students change. You want to you want to set expectations. You want those to be clear and consistent because if they aren't, students aren't going to believe you and they're going to disengage. Why? Because you're not consistent. Okay, the result will be limited growth, if any. But if you're consistent, the next piece is is rewarding the effort by grading the result of the effort and not sort of the, you know, kind of one or zero or right or wrong end product, okay? Because you're going to have high-level students with lots of opportunity and exposure in their life who can give you the, the, the quote-unquote right answer with little effort. But those students have not been challenged. They, have, they haven't developed anything new. They haven't developed any new skill. They haven't developed any new knowledge and so on. Um, and so what was the change? What are you really grading? Okay, you're grading maybe their good home life or their ability to take vacations to exotic places. But the student who comes and who uh, enters at a point that's really low level and puts in a lot of effort and gets to a point that's mid-level, that is huge growth, that is huge effort as a result of a huge effort, and that is exemplary level work. Okay, and so you should be requiring that same type of effort from higher level students by drilling them deeper in other areas. And I'm going to explain what I mean by that. Brings me to the fourth habit. Um, and if you, uh, if you want to, before I kind of jump into that, if you, want, if you take a look under noadam.com forward slash resources, um, there is a bunch of uh, webinars, eBooks, and blog posts. All this stuff's free, by the way, to engage in. Um, that you can take a look at to get more into what grid is and how that works and, and so on. Uh, but the fourth one here, creating an environment where challenge exceeds skill. And this is a definition of rigor from Angela Duckworth that I borrow. Because frankly, many people talk about rigor 
and they're entirely off. Okay, rigor is not about repetition. In a highly effective classroom, rigor is about challenging students beyond where their existing skills are at. And by doing so, you create a kind of gap. Okay, that gap between where they're at and the skills that they need to be to accomplish something in this task or in this challenge. Okay? That gap is the opportunity for growth. Okay, that's what rigor is. If if all you do is give students words that they already know, they don't develop new vocabulary. If all you do is give students what to do, they don't ever develop the skill and how to plan what to do. They don't learn how to develop models. They only learn how to use models. Okay, so this is very connected not only to the standards, um, but to skills and to other content areas. So creating an environment where challenge exceeds skill is not just unique to science, but in fact, or engineering, but in fact it, it it uses ELA and math as part of that science and engineering time. And you could even say that, you know, you could take the same thing, forget about science or engineering, and just apply it to math or to ELA. Okay? So creating an environment where challenge exceeds skill means engaging in answering questions and solving problems as scientists and engineers, but challenging the student to do that, to do it by creating concept to concept, concept to self, concept to world connections, and leveraging their ELA skills and leveraging their math skills to accomplish that. Okay? And one way uh, of doing this, a model that we've developed and that you can see, we have free um, sample lesson plans um, online that you can check out under curriculum. Uh, and you can see how this is set up. So what we do is, is we use nonfiction reading to give everybody common background. And then we launch into a Socratic dialogue so we set the teacher up for that, um, to, to ask higher order questions of those students so they develop those concept to concept, concept to self, concept to world connections. That's key. So that's where we're bringing in that why, what, how purpose. And then we come to a problem or question where our students can break into those teams, you know, small group student learning. And we're big fans on teams of two so that you as a teacher can see Drill really down deeply into what each child knows as they're coming to checkpoints. Okay? It's clear. There's no student who may be contributing. It's clear who is contributing, and there's plenty for each student to do. Um, so students plan those investigations. And then, well, of course, once they have a plan and they've worked through that together with their partner, with their teacher, then they carry that plan out. And then the result of carrying that out is, well, that's the experiment, gives us data. We use the data to form evidence-based conclusions that students then share back and debrief, okay? And so this, is, this really is a lesson. It takes place maybe over a week or two weeks. It really depends. Um, and it, again, depends on the grade level you're at. But even for first grade, second grade students, at a first grade, second grade level, they, students can do this. It's just that it's much more basic. And the level of nuance and, and sophistication is basic. But as you climb third grade, fourth grade, fifth grade, that complexity increases, okay? But it's that same sort of, this is the context for learning in three dimensions, okay? And that's why you see highly effective classrooms have grade-specific scope and sequence, unit orders, vocabulary, lesson plans. Um, all of that is grade-specific, and, and it matters. It absolutely matters because what you can do, and I'm using an example from Now Adam here, um, which is actually what I taught in my classroom um, as well, uh, is that early versions of it, I guess, I would say. It's much different now than it was even back then. It's so much better. But um, the thing is, is that what you can do with that unit scope and sequence is you can paint a big picture of what science and engineering is but you can have engineered connections. So you can see here that the Earth's surface, you look at grade two, the connections between Earth's surface and living Earth is that the characteristics of Earth's surface provide for life. And they actually define the different kinds of life that exists on Earth, whether they're plants or animals. And that has to do with water, it has to do with landforms. And so we can take that further by looking at the specific plants and how they're structured, and how they have adapted or, or how they're built to to actually inhabit an area and how those plants interact with animals and how there's this predator and prey relationship and how things like insects and animals have life cycles 
things like butterflies and moths, and how all of this is relying on energy and how we see that play out in actions and reactions in physics. And whether that is, you know, um, objects hitting each other as they roll down a hill, um, or marbles down a ramp or something like this, um, or within the context of circuits and the electricity that makes most of modern life possible, uh, or in boats, or even, you know, as we engineer boats and the different challenges they have to overcome, or even in the kinds of homes and insulation uh, differences that we have. So, so the, the point that I'm making here is that, you know, you have to um, create an environment where everything is intentional, and it's intentional in terms of its scope and sequence, and then it's intentionally creating a space that's rigorous for students. And as the students develop the skills to meet the challenge, what you're doing is, is you are upping the challenge progressively. Okay, this is not a willy-nilly thing. Okay, so it takes a very specific kind of resource set. And what we aim at here at No Atom is mastery readiness. But I just want to define just very quickly for you what these other, you know, um, levels are all about. So mastery readiness means that students have developed skills and knowledge that they can generalize, that they can use it to solve any problem or answer any question. Okay. So awareness is really just students being aware that something exists. You know, think about a trip to the museum. Everything's, you know, on the wall, words on the wall, plastic dioramas and buttons to push and so on, right? So, okay, you know, just because you've seen the picture of the, you know, blueberry cut in half and the fact that the inside is also blue or, you know, whatever, I forget if it's blue or it's not blue, um, but long story short, the, you know, it doesn't mean that you understand um, how... <laughs> you know, how that blueberry came to be blue, why it's adapted that way, and how that connects with its seed dispersal mechanism, and how that helps to perpetuate blueberries in our, the ecosystem where blueberries exist, uh, and how it forms part of a food chain and food web. You're just aware <clears throat> about the blue of blueberries. Now, the thing is that knowledge readiness is the kind of thing that we often, and you know, so awareness ready resources, the kind you often download off teacher to teacher sites, off museum websites, um, you go to the big NSTA fairs and you buy the books at the, the book thing, uh, the guys that sell the books and the bookstore at the NSTA, um, and the people who are trying to hawk, you know, kits of, you know, $200 kit for this and that, okay, that's awareness ready stuff. Um, knowledge ready stuff is like textbooks, learning all about something, learning all about what scientists have discovered and what engineers have created to solve problems. It's kind of backward looking, okay. Performance readiness is often uh, something that I would associate with, again, back to the kit people. Um, so kits, you know, okay, you get your rock and mineral kit, and you use that for three months, and students learn if you want to find out how hard a rock or mineral is, you scratch it on these different surfaces. Okay, so it's kind of task-oriented. They learn to perform a task. Mastery readiness has to do with students being able to to look at a novel scenario and be able to form, um, uh, analyze it and form uh, an approach to answering a question or solving a problem related to that scenario and connect other lessons and other units knowledge with it and to be able to form an evidence-based conclusion based on their analysis. And, uh, you know, no Adam, one of the things that makes us really unique Frankly, I don't think any other curriculum source out there has actually done that well um, besides No Adam. I think that there are some workbooks out there uh, that have hands-on sort of experiments and, and things like that that are, are associated with them, but a fun functionally what it is is a text with questions that have been inserted. So the, the, the point I want to make here is that if you want to challenge students at the highest level, you need a level of sophistication in the resources that, in the articulation of what um, your classroom is, is focusing on. Otherwise, you're leaving a, 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 an opportunity for gaps, um, and it's very hard to do that, uh, you know, um, on the fly. So, 
uh, when I talk about skills, what skills am I talking about specifically? These are the science and engineering practices. Okay, those are the skills I'm talking about. That it, and, and these are skills that students have developed and can demonstrate as a result of instruction and demonstrate repeatedly in different contexts. The ability to ask questions and define problems, not only use models but develop them independently, not only carry out investigations but plan them independently, not only interpret data but analyze it independently, use their mathematical thinking, construct an explanation, design solutions okay, from scratch on their own, argue from evidence. Okay, Whose evidence? Sometimes their evidence, sometimes somebody else's evidence. That argument may be in support of or not, but no matter what, they need to be able to develop and use the evidence in support of their argument. And that's part of this last one, obtaining, evaluating, and communicating information. So really um, key. Okay, so maybe I should have talked about this earlier, but you know, these are the skills and that's why scope and sequence, you know, age appropriateness, uh, having challenge that exceeds skill, and then having that all aligned to the new standards in a nurturing way September through June and from one grade to the next is so important. Okay, it's really, and that's the thing, is it's a, it's a district level, you know, kind of thinking um, that's reflected in a highly effective teacher's classroom. Okay, so the two kind of go hand in hand. And it's usually, you know, you know bottom up, I'm a, I'm a fan of, of bottom up, um, but rarely, but occasionally it comes top down. It can be, can be either way. Um, the fifth habit is using full release responsibility as a tool for mastery. So basically, when you think about rigor as challenging students um, so that they, so that, you know, the challenge exceeds the skill, that means students are going to be engaged in analyzing their, their, their data. They are going to be developing plans which they carry out. There's going to, it's going to be very authentic, okay? And so, um, rigor is not about repetition, and mastery is not about uh, recall. Mastery is about being able to generalize and synthesize and create, evaluate, and analyze a novel scenario. Okay, And in order to do that, one of the keys um, that we use and that I used in my classroom is scientific process and engineering design process. This is something that the new standards talk about. They talk about scientific process and engineering design process, but they're largely silent on what that process is. If you talk to anybody from STEM industry, they'll tell you, yeah, you know, I'm a scientist, I'm an engineer, and we use process. What the process they use is going to be probably very different than what I'm showing you, but there's going to be a lot of parallels. These two processes are processes that we have developed and refined over time, over 10 years, um, and found to be very successful in helping children, and this is the key. The process, so science is in the context of answering a question, engineering is in the context of solving a problem. The process is how we unpack the question and do so with the goal and direction of actually answering it. Okay, and doing so in a replicable way, using our science and engineering practices. In the case of engineering design, it's the same thing. It's how we go about identifying and then solving a problem you know, with the goal of a replicable technology okay, that's evidence-based. And so that's what these steps are all about. It's unpacking that problem towards a evidence-based technology in that conclusion. Okay? That's how all of those science and engineering practices are uh, reinforced and applied. So in a highly effective classroom, you know, that's what's going on. That's why you need that release of responsibility. You know, one, a teacher who gives, you know, the question and the research and the hypothesis experiment, all this stuff to the students, students haven't developed any skill. All they're going to do is follow, okay? But when you look at these practices, it's the student who must be able to develop the model. They must be able to plan the investigation, okay? Somebody who gives all of this to students has done a student a disservice, okay? But it's very common that that happens, okay? That's why you need that full release of responsibility. It's a tool for mastery. Now, what does that look like practically in the classroom? 
in our curriculum, uh, in my experience too in, in the classroom, uh, this is what it looks like. So group think to that kind of collaborative element is what you spend all of your August and September on if you're in school in August. If you're in school in July, I'm sorry, but okay, um, start in July. But the key is the first month to month and a half of school is all about transitioning from group think to collaborative. I used to call this guided, but the reality is is that the teacher is facilitating group think. They're not guiding, in the, in, and people will use guiding in the wrong sense. They're not guiding by show and tell and demonstrate. Okay, they're asking the question and they're sourcing, they're crowdsourcing the different elements of a process from the crowd as they develop the group think and experiment a plan together and then students then break into their groups to carry out that plan. Okay, so what happens is, is from October, November, think about Thanksgiving, you reach that 10th to, you know, 12th week of school, uh, you should be having that full release of responsibility to where students are acting independently in teams. With, and the goal here is independent proficiency with those science and engineering practices. From November through January, it's about refining. Okay, so students are coming to you at checkpoints and they're going to be a hot mess in October and November. They're still going to be a hot mess in December. But what's happening is, is that you're U-turning them when they come up and they haven't met expectations and they're confused and you ask some questions and now it's been clarified, they get a U-turn to go back and make changes and then, you know, come back to you and move on. That whole process is something that gets shorter and easier and faster and clearer uh, for teachers and students um, in that November to January stretch. And then kind of mid-January to late January, what we see is the ability to push those students much, much deeper with how they're expressing their higher order thinking, okay? And how you pair students in this environment is really important too. Um, you know, uh, we tend to say pair high-level students with high-level students, not because, they, you know, let them soar on wings of glory and, you know, be the golden children. No, what you want to do is you need partnerships where students agree with each other. And so oftentimes students who are kind of the fragile perfects or are the high level students uh, only are used to having it their way. And when they're paired with somebody who's like themselves, they have to learn the 21st century skill of collaboration. And it causes them to grow. It challenges them in a way they don't have that collaborative skill yet. It causes them to grow. So that's part of what you see in this timeline too. Okay, pairing low-level students with mid-level students, um, students begin to learn that, you know, again, their ideas matter in a partnership and that, you know, other people have ideas that they don't have and they have ideas that other people don't have. And so this all works really uh, well. And that's, again, one of the reasons why an intentional scope and sequence is so important because you can, you know, you can intentionally ratchet up the expectations as you go along like we do. Okay, so number six, and we are almost through here. A number six is giving immediate helpful feedback as a coach and not an expert. Okay, so that brings us back to this role. So this is the teacher as coach, not getting between the content and the student, but helping strengthen the connection and the interaction between the two. It's not just, you know, uh, you know, my experience as a, as a teacher with a top performing classroom, um, but it's, it's also what the new standards are asking for. When you look at the next generation science standards, they go all the way back to the National Research Council and even the Carnegie Corporation. But there is a definition, we have a whole webinar about this, uh, actually one coming up, which you're welcome to join. Uh, but you should know that there's a new definition of effective STEM instruction. Okay, and, and helpful feedback ties into this. This is the definition, that effective STEM instruction capitalizes on students' early interest and experiences, it, and that's that intentional nurturing. It identifies and builds on what they know. So, you know, again, thinking about scaffolding, and provides students with the experiences to engage them in the practices, that's the skills, that are specific to science and sustain their interests. And again, how do you sustain their interest? By having something rigorous, something purposeful, and something that's challenging. It's moving from what you see on the left, which is that traditional model. Look at, this is, you know, people talk about, I do, we do, you do. That's completely backwards. If I do it, and then we do it, 
what's left for you to do. Okay? On the right, this is the other way around. Okay, it's a you do it. This is actually a picture from my classroom. If you, uh, this is a you do it. And uh, if you can't do it, then we'll think together. I'll be your thought partner. Okay? And that's where the coach connection comes in. I'm not going to tell you the answer. I'm not going to just shut down and say, oh, you're going to have to ask somebody. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask you hard questions that are specific, and I'm going to cause you to have to think. I have to think about what you've written and think about the connections to other content, to yourself, to what we've learned previously. And so by doing so, the work is on you, the student, um, but it's meaningful and you actually begin to build a framework of understanding. And we're going to talk about that more in a second. That's what's going on at these checkpoints as students are creating their plans. Okay? And even after, as the students have done their experiment, it still comes back to their conclusion. Question, hypothesis, claim, evidence, reasoning. That's that claim, evidence, reasoning model of writing. And so I'm thinking as a teacher, this is something you can implement tomorrow. As students are forming conclusions, this is what I'm scanning for. Okay, I'm not reading, they're reading to me. I'm listening for their question. I'm listening for the hypothesis. I'm listening for the claim. I'm listening for the evidence and I'm listening for consistent reasoning. Okay? And I'm going to ask questions when I see something that's out of line. Or I may just ask questions when I see something in line because I'm not sure that both partners had an equal role in this. Okay? And through the process, by being that skillful coach and asking those questions, back to the Socratic method I was talking about. You know, that's why highly effective teachers use Socratic methods, Socratic questioning, Socratic dialogue. It's because what I've underlined and bolded here is something that's developed through that questioning process. Okay. Last bit. I hope you have five minutes to hang on here. Number seven is building a framework of concept knowledge with science and engineering practices. Okay. So these are the new standards, right? They have three dimensions. And even if you're in an adaptive state like Massachusetts, West Virginia, and um, we consider California adaptive because we, we have a special um, curriculum for California because California has done things a little differently than uh, straight NGSS adoptions in other states. But nonetheless, we comply to both uh, by design. The key here is that, um, that to build the framework, you have to, you have to think about these standards themselves as performance expectations that are part of a framework, okay? So in order for a student to demonstrate understanding, okay, by developing a model and so on, they have to have mastered the practice, the content, and the concept in a context in the classroom. And that's going to, pro that is going to have basically pulled all the threads together, have woven it together in such a way that a student can now demonstrate that understanding in a novel context. And so, when you look at how to build that framework, it relies on that scope and sequence, but where does that come from? Well, it comes from the standards, and then the district curriculum falls from that, and from the district curriculum falls the student experience, and that's the threshold of the classroom. This is where, as educators in the classroom, we take over. Now, unfortunately, standard, the, the district curriculum, in, for many folks, is either non-existent, it's of poor quality, it's fractured, it's sort of some residual bits and pieces that are left over in broken kits from 10 years ago or 15-year-old textbooks or you know, whatever it is. So, you know, unfortunately, when it falls on the teacher, um, there can be, you know, you see lots of highs and lows across districts. Um, and that's un unfortunate because it's really not the teacher's job to do the district's job and, the, you know, so on and so forth. But um, the key here is that the student learning comes from the student experience that's created by the district curriculum. And as a result of student learning, that's where we get the evidence of learning, and that's what the Next Generation Science uh, Standards evidence statements are all about. So as a result of that classroom experience, a student who has learned what is necessary to perform the expectations of the standard is going to be able to demonstrate by developing a model to describe phenomena and all these different elements as a part of it in connection with describing the relationships among the different components in that ecosystem. And it's kind of flushed out here. And the connections. And this actually, this, is, this diagram is not uh, my diagram. This actually is from the new standards themselves. 
So when we think of curriculum and how it's created, you know, you see a grid like this, but behind all of it, every one of these lessons and units is supported by the actual evidence um, statements, the evidence expectations of the standards themselves. So you think about it, over the course of a year, you weave all of this um, fabric of understanding of all these different ideas all the way up first grade through eighth grade. And what's great though is as the students progress from one grade level to the next, if you've done things well as we have, the I think of it like sheets, you know, the thread count increases. So what happens is students get a new angle they get deeper understanding. And as a result of that, um, they become more proficient and better able to generalize and synthesize with what they've learned. Okay, so you can take action on that in the classroom simply by viewing these standards, the new standards, as performance expectations that require the classroom to be a context where these three dimensions can come together and that it, they actually connect in groups to other standards. They're not taught in isolation. And that's one of the key um, misconceptions is people will say, oh, we have grade-specific standards now. We don't, actually. We have standards that are intended to be mastered by the end of certain grade levels, but they should be introduced, um, mastered, and reinforced for years prior, okay, because you don't master something in a single year. Uh, anyway, you know, the, any skill is not mastered in a single moment. So nonetheless, I will leave you with that. Uh, some folks have asked to see what data looked like um, from my classroom, so I'll show that. So this is my classroom on the right, and on the left uh, you can see um, the state averages. And when we drill down into that, these were the actual standardized, some of them, there's others. I'm not even sure if this was the highest year, but but nonetheless, so you can see. You can, we were outperforming by 40%, 42% in some of these areas. Um, but yeah, anywhere anywhere from like 10, 15% all the way as high as 40% in different dimensions of that testing. And what's great is is that um, you know we see that happening in our clients too. So if you look across urban clients where there's 75% high needs, 72% low income, 35% ELL students, uh, you can see you know stu the state average here is 50% going from well below 50% to uh, adding over 51 points um, and reaching like 86 or 89 percent up there. Other districts, you know, only 20 percent high needs, 7 percent low income, and they still get giant gains and sustain them, um, and so on. You can see it down. This is, uh, I'll show this to you, this is the highest uh, performing district in Massachusetts, and you can see even they get a bump up at the 90th, uh, 90 percent advanced and proficient. We had a school last year we have a school this year that's 50% advanced, or we would many states would call with distinction, um, and so on. And even the lowest middle schools we've brought up, you can see over the course of a couple of years, brought up 24 points in, in two years. Um, and this is just, you know, average teachers um, just doing things a little differently, using, you know, trying, and the reality is, is these are habits, right? And that's this is the stats on that school. You can see, you know, 95% low income and so on. Um, you know, the reality is is that these are just average people trying to be better, um, trying to better themselves, better their students, better their community. Um, that's what I am. Uh, that's who we are here at No Adam. And so, you know, I think these seven habits are really important for everybody uh, because, unfortunately, people focus on test prep. They focus on test scores. They focus on students in their seats, quiet, doing what they're told. Um, it's kind of a law and order in some cases. In other cases, people really focus on a lack of structure to the point where, you know, we do lots of great fun things because they're fun, um, but we never really structure um, the learning to the point where we engage in things that really aren't fun. Um, because, frankly, anything that is worth accomplishing is difficult. And so skill development is difficult. and um, to, to lack that expectation in students makes, um, you know, makes, makes for a tough road ahead for, for many kids. And we see that even in AP classes in high school. So anyhow, I'll, I'll stick around for a few minutes. I know we're about five minutes over here. I'll stick around for about 10 minutes, try to answer some specific questions. I'm just going to flash some resources up here for you. Um, 
And if you, I would recommend these first two if you're in a process of curriculum review or you are trying to develop your own curriculum or anything like that. Check out the EQIP rubric. Uh, you can get to it by this link or the peak alignment, which is the performance evaluation of something criteria. Okay. And um, you can also learn about more of these webinars and so on through our blog, social media, follow us whatever, Twitter, that kind of thing. And if you have any specific questions to reach out by phone or by email to either uh, Karen or by, to me by email, uh, our information's on the, on the screen. So I'm going to just take a quick look here at the questions and see if I can take at least two or three. Um, folks who have asked about uh, PD certificates, if you would like a certificate of participation, unfortunately there's not a deliverable here, so we can't give you any kind of grad credit or um, uh, other certain types of PDPs, but what we can do is we can give you a certificate of participation. Um, what you should do is email Karen, kpeake, k-p-e-a-k-e, -E, at noadam.com, um, or call her, and she can arrange that for you. Um, so this is kind of interesting. Um, so somebody asked about um, time on learning. How do you prioritize which unit to teach uh, at, let's say, any particular grade level, because this is relevant to everybody, if you only have 40 minutes a day to teach science or social studies or health? Uh, or, you know, any other subject, throw that in there. The reality is, um, and we have this on our website, there's a blog post about it, at the grade three to five level, um, t there should be two and a half to three hours a week of time on learning. So if you have 40 minutes a day, basically you need to be spending, you know, three days a week on science. Um, if you're not, then you need to go back to your principal and you need to go back to the schedule and you've got to um, have a discussion with them because you will not have, and that needs to be on every week basis entire school year. Um, if you don't have that, you're setting yourself up for, you know, disappointment. Uh, and it's doing a disservice to the children. Um, the, other, the other thing you don't want to do is you don't want to have a unit go on for three months. You don't want to alternate, do health one week, science the next week, or do health for one month, science for the one month, because you lose momentum. Skills require deliberate practice, and they re require not only deliberate practice, but recurring deliberate practice, um, which is in close proximity to other periods of deliberate practice in the same area. So you think about what are we practicing? We're practicing the science and engineering practices. What's changing over time? The context that we're practicing them in. Okay? And so that all takes time. Um, and if you try, you know, and I think this is one of the points I want to make here, is that there are, you can, you know, the NSTA bookstore is full of all these books, and the NSTA show is full of all of these uh, vendors who are selling things that they say are NGSS aligned, that are easy, and look, here's a diagram and a video you show the students and whatever. Guess what? Um, you know, the, the, those are diet pills. Those are the diet pill equivalent of NGSS resources. Um, you know, diet pills still sell, but they don't really work. If you want to be healthy uh, and so on, <laughs> you need to actually commit to certain behaviors. Um, and in the case of um, the new standards, you have to commit to certain amounts of time on learning, you have to commit to, to certain level of rigor, and you have to commit to a certain level of scope and sequence. Uh, it's not a once and done, fast and easy kind of thing. Okay. Unfortunately, some people make money by telling folks that it's a fast and easy kind of thing, but it's not. Um, it takes effort. Um, it's not easy to be effective. A couple other questions in here. Some people, okay, some people took a look at some no atom resources and said, hey, I see multiple choice questions and fill in worksheets. Didn't you say these were ineffective? That's a great question. Um, you, so the, um, 
there aren't worksheets, first of all. Uh, what depends on grade, what grade level you're looking at. Uh, if you look at an early grade level, what you're going to see is a gradual release of responsibility where students have ownership over specific segments of the scientific or engineering design process. And what happens is, is over the course of different lessons and in fact over multiple units, and you can only access the first unit of the year online. Um, if you're looking for something else, please reach out to Karen, give her a call, and she will um, see about connecting you with other things so you can see how this works. But basically, um, those are not worksheets. They are actual um, part of an experience that a student is engaging in, um, planning, developing, and then carrying out for themselves, gathering data, creating scientific diagrams, and then forming evidence-based conclusions. So, um, you know, do they look like a, a worksheet? You know, visually they might, if you don't know what it is. I'm glad you asked the question, uh, but they're not. Now you ask about multiple choice. Now, what you'll see in the assessment section is you will see some vocabulary check questions that will be multiple choice, um, but that's just an assessment. It's not actually, an assessment is not uh, the form for learning. And I think people question, you know, they, they mess this up all the time. Um, so assessment just is a tool to understand uh, elements of what a child has learned to try and gather evidence of it. So multiple choice uh, in those vocabulary uh, checks that you're looking at, those are just uh, like a ticket to leave or a quick homework piece where um, a student can signal to you that they understand the, the meaning of vocabulary terms, okay? Now, the real assessments that are part of these different units are how the students have engaged in the investigations and in planning. Okay, and again, there's a lot of more specifics we could go into, and I don't want to do that now because I want to take a couple other questions. Um, there are multiple choice, the other place that you'll see multiple choices in relation to something called a concept assessment. So we have, with, we have segments of our concept assessment which mirror exactly the next generation um, standardized assessments. And if you were a peak, not a peak, a um, park district or a park state, um, you know how performance-based testing works. You have a scenario and then a series of questions that relate to it. Um, so on the, under those concept assessments, uh, what you'll see is exactly that, but it's the science version. So you see a scenario that a student has to analyze, and then we tease out all of the elements of the uh, performance expectations um, in the subsequent questions. The multiple choices are just giving us additional data on whether a student can generalize what they've learned in that unit uh, by applying it uh, to a, a new context. So I'll give you an example. Um, we might have a multiple choice question that asks about um, a melting chocolate bar and it's, you know, what element, what, what property has changed or what property has remained constant and there would be multiple choices there. The student has not learned anything about chocolate bars. Okay, they've learned about states of matter. They've learned about phase change in other contexts, but not that context. So it's kind of, you know, we still have within the assessment component some multiple choice, but it has very specific purpose. Um, it's not the learning. Uh, it's not the modality of learning. Uh, some folks have mentioned about seeing stuff aligned with California. I would say reach out to Karen if you'd like, or otherwise you can, what's on our website that you download is uh, valid for both California and general NGSS adoption states. Uh, we have specific stuff for Massachusetts that you have to click to Massachusetts for, which is an adaption, an adaptive, sorry, state. Uh, other folks have asked if there are copies of the webinar. Um, specifically like a slideshow that you can print, reach out to Karen and she will see about getting that to you. Um, other folks have asked about it, what will be available from this webinar after. In about 24 hours, you will get a link to the video. Um, we will then also post um, that online. So if you want to share the page that you signed up for this webinar with a colleague, a friend, whatever. Um, if they sign up for the webinar the way you did, they will actually be taken to a recording of the live webinar. Um, 
and some folks have asked for specific examples of a third or fourth grade lesson starting with why. Um, I would uh, say please download a third or fourth grade unit. Take a look at that. Take a look at the lesson within it and how that gets going. And then reach back to us simply because um, these teacher units, to really explain this, it's, you know, it's a webinar in and of itself. Um, and the teacher's unit is, you know, it's got some girth to it. Um, it's probably 60 to 100 pages, depending on the grade level you're looking at. With that said, we're about 15 minutes over. I want to thank you all for joining us. Um, and, you know, the last bit I'll leave you with is kind of a conglomerate of the final question here. You know, how do you ensure that teachers know and communicate the standards to students? Um, the reality is, the, you know, this is probably going to cause you to fall off your seat, um, but the fact that the student knows the literal standard really isn't that important. What's really important is that the teacher knows the literal standard and understands its connection to other standards. Now, you might say something like, well, you know, the research shows that, you know, writing standards on the board increases performance and so on and so forth. Well, that's a very limited area of research. Now, if you go into an urban environment, you go into a classroom like an, that, that's oftentimes found in an urban environment or even rural environments where um, you have people who are entirely new to teaching. If as an administrator you require them to write the student the standard on the board and then you require them to read the standard aloud to the students, you're not really doing anything for the student so much, but what you are doing is, is you are forcing that teacher to have thought about the, st the standard at least for a moment, enough to have written it down and to have heard it. And that has an effect on that teacher's behavior in terms of what they spend their next 40 minutes doing. So, you know, the reality here is that writing the standard on the board, and I, and I, I take that angle to this because um, that's how we often see students and teachers uh, interacting with the standards. Um, it's, it's, not, um, it's not helpful. It's in fact, it's a waste of time. Um, when you look at things like a, one of the earlier questions from a teacher, I only have 40 minutes a day to do science. I want you to think about this. If you have 40 minutes a day to do science and you take five minutes for an opening activity that really takes 10 minutes and then you have um, so, you know, call it a do now, and then you have a summarizer that takes 10 or 15 minutes. Right there, you have lost 25 minutes of your 40 minutes of time on learning to an activity that, by and large, is not part of the core of instruction, okay? And so how is it that with 15 minutes, a teacher is going to accomplish all of the goals of these standards? And I also want to point out to you that these new standards, whether you're in an adaptive state or in an adoptive state, this is not the standard, okay? This is a performance expectation. This entire rendering that's on your board or on your screen right now, this is the standard. A teacher doesn't have time to write all of that, and even if you print them out and stick them on the wall, you know, it has very limited value. Uh, so what I would say is take your core, your time on learning, okay? If you have an entrance or an exit activity, fine, but make it serve the purpose, okay? Serve the higher purpose of just helping students transition out and in. That's it, okay? Limit it to five minutes and, and have it be that. Um, and I don't, if you want that to be reading the standard aloud or something like that, fine. What's important here to get teachers to understand the standards is to get them to sit down and to use these rubrics that I'm showing you, specifically this equip rubric. Have them bring their curriculum. Have them look at the equip rubric and don't have them try and squint and, and, and uh, you know, the gray area. Be very clinical about it. Look at what you have. Look at the rubric and, and be honest with yourselves as a team. That's the only way you can move forward, and, and, and being honest with yourself means also being willing to abandon a lot of what you've done in the past, because if it's built around the prior standards, most likely it doesn't align to the new standards, 
okay? And the thing is, is that it's not just all on the teachers. I don't, I, I don't particularly believe that it's the teacher's job to create, create curriculum. Um, I believe it's the teacher's job to meet students' needs. I believe it's the teacher's job to breathe life into curriculum um, and to help that curriculum actually connect with students and create that uh, next generation inquiry environment and be the skillful coach. But when you look at curriculum, you need to look at this other rubric. This is the, you know, the performance evaluation criteria uh, rubric. Curriculum is at a district level. If you have every teacher creating curriculum on their own, then as a child chases rent around your district, or they enter your district for the first time, or they move to a different school, you are going to have systemic gaps that are across your district that you will never, ever be able to chase down. Okay, it's like glitter. You know when you spill glitter on yourself and you see it for 100 years because it gets in every little nook and cranny? Well, if every corner of your district is doing something different, if everybody's freelancing, then, then you don't have real curriculum. And so sit your teachers down, help them to get to know the standards by looking at the standards specifically, and you can do that. Go to Next Generation, um, you know, sciencestandards.org. You can just Google it. Uh, or if you want, you can reach out to Karen or even myself and we'll get you connected. Uh, look at the standards. Look at uh, the, we have a couple other resources we can send your way. We have one on um, what students know and can do in uh, K-12 science education and also the, um, the uh, National Research Council's report too that led up to the standards. Um, those are all key documents, okay, that you want to take a look at. Anyhow, um, I have other questions here that people are asking, and I'm sorry, there's so many of you, and we're out of time. If I haven't been able to get to your question, please email me or email Karen, and we will get you an answer. Um, there are things we can talk about here regarding ELLs, special education, and so on. Um, they do have easy answers, but unfortunately, it just takes more time than what we've got, but it is possible. Thank you all for joining us. Thank you for... Uh, your commitment to your students and to your communities. And I would let you know that um, we hope that you'll reach out to us if you need any help. We've got a bunch of free resources. We also have curriculum materials and professional development that all fit together uh, aligned to the next generation science standards that are being used by thousands of students and um, classrooms around the country. And if that's something that would be appropriate for your community, um, please reach out to us. We don't sell to individual teachers, but we do um, enable districts uh, if the district is interested. We thank you and have a great afternoon or evening. Bye-bye.